On this week in enterprise tech, a 14 terabyte SSD, a hospital gets crypto locked, Apple gets FBI'd, and the internet of insecure things. Twilight on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for this week in enterprise tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, everybody. It's time for our annual audience survey. We'd really like to hear from you. It helps us understand our audience better, know what you like and don't like, how you listen to the show. It also helps us tell advertisers what kind of people listen. But I promise you, your feedback is always kept personally anonymous. All you have to do is visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It'll just take a few minutes and it'll help us make Twit even better. We really appreciate your support and any help you can give us. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 177, recorded February 19th, 2016. Ron Culler and the Internet of Insecure Things. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100-plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash quiet. And by Igloo Software. Igloo is an internet you'll actually like. It connects people with the information they need to do their best work. Try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for the live demo to see it in action. And by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your house. Right now, get free expedited FedEx shipping when you go to ring.com slash enterprise. Welcome to Twyatt. This week at Enterprise Tech, it's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But I'm not guiding you by myself. I've got my friends, my long-term cohorts in enterprise crime, starting with Mr. Brian Chi. He's the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, how's the surf doing, man? Well, it wasn't quite big enough for the Eddie Aikau tourney. It was, I think it was only 20, 25 feet. Boom, 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 boom. But uh, the uh, traffic of people trying to watch the surf meet was staggering. I, I think I, I, I think most people in the mainland would exchange their traffic for your traffic if they could be where you were at. So I don't know, man. I, I, I just stayed home and watched it on TV because then I didn't have to fight the traffic. There we go. Another man who doesn't have to fight traffic because, well, he's just everywhere at once is Mr. Curtis Franklin of Information Week Radio. Curtis, I'm surprised we find you at home today. Normally you'd be gallivanting around the world, picking up various enterprise conferences. Uh, what What's going on at uh, Information Week? Well, this, this week has been interesting. I actually took the week off and celebrated that fact by being incredibly ill all week. Um, though today we did make a dash to Orlando to visit a place that uh, Chebert knows well, Skycraft. Um, dashed back, and the fact that I'm here is due to the wonders of Truck Stop Coffee. <laughs> there we go. Well, folks, that's how the Twyatt crew is uh, going to deliver the news. So let's just get to it by jumping in to the blips. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you like fast, reliable, and ridiculously large enterprise class storage? Well, if you do, then Intel might have your next piece of gear lust. With a little help from Micron, and uh, of course that company already makes all the flash memory you find in Intel SSDs, they've started mass volume shipments of their new 3D NAND parts. The new pack parts stack layers of flash memory on top of each other, increasing storage density and decreasing addressing time. Not to be confused with Intel and Micron's X-Point technology, which is still being tweaked in the lab, the new Micron parts nonetheless help Intel close the gap between their current SSD offerings and those of Samsung and Toshiba, which switched to 3D NAND half a decade ago. Furthermore, Micron claims that these new processes allow them to make NAND with triple the density of their competitors, which translates into much bigger Intel SSDs. How big? Well, Intel's current largest SSD is 4 terabytes. 
And with Intel's enterprise offerings a bit long in the tooth, several analysts are suggesting that this announcement heralds the inevitable release of a 14 terabyte PCIe attached NVMe enabled enterprise drive. Best start saving your pennies now, though, as those new parts will probably retail for just north of 10 grand. Illumio brings AD to dynamic security. Security firm Illumio has been part of the enterprise security market since uh, 2014 with an approach it calls its Adaptive Security Platform, or ASP. Now, this watches application operations and formulates rules to govern what types of traffic it can receive based on what it learns. Now, it's extending that approach more deeply into the organizations through a concept it calls adaptive user segmentation, an abstract term for the process of drawing up rules that fit profiles of individual users of an application. To do so, it's integrated the ASP platform with the information in Active Directory. The heart of the platform is a policy compute engine which collects context from the operation of a running application, develops an understanding of how it should operate, and formulates rules governing what types of traffic can access it. Illumio's development is one more sign that enterprise security is moving farther from the perimeter and closer to the core. Oh my goodness, simply not so safe. In what has become an all-too-familiar story, Forbes broke a story about the Simply Safe home alarm system that has so badly ignored network security that anyone within a couple hundred feet of your home can, with only rudimentary hacking skills, disable your alarm system. Worse, the system is not set up for over-the-air updates, so Simply Safe owners aren't going to get a fix anytime soon. Now, getting crypt locked by malware is frustrating, annoying, and more than just a little enraging. But now we've got a story that can put your story into perspective. Having your files encrypted by software that you probably had something to do with allowing onto your system is embarrassing. But allowing that software to lock down a hospital's data system, well, that's downright dangerous. And that's exactly what happened to Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center in Los Angeles. Two weeks ago, the staff of the 434-bed hospital noticed that certain computers controlling lab work, the pharmacy, and the patient record system were inaccessible. With access to the electronic medical record systems disabled or untrustworthy, patients were forced to pick up lab results in person, records were not being properly updated, and even the emergency room scheduling system was compromised. Russian hackers demanded a $3.6 million ransom to release the affected systems, so the hospital called in the FBI for help. After 10 days of dealing with a disabled network, the hospital administrators decided that the best course of action was to pay the CryptLock ransom. After some negotiation with the Russian hackers, they settled on 40 bitcoins, or approximately $17,000. While paying ransom is always a bitter pill to swallow, at least they can take solace in the fact that 17 k is nowhere near the original asking price. Apache aims an arrow at big data. The world of big data took a step towards seamlessly connecting everything with everything else with the announcement of Apache Arrow by the Apache Software Foundation. The Apache Software Foundation expects Apache Arrow to cut communications overhead and boost the performance of analytical workloads by a hundredfold. Arrow code is available now for implementation in C, C++, Python, and Java, with future implementations due in one to two months for R, JavaScript, and Julia. At its heart, Arrow creates an internal representation of each big data system component so that data doesn't have to be copied and converted as it moves from Spark to Cassandra, from Apache Drill to Kudu, and, and similar translations. It does a number of other things, but the biggest impact of this top-level Apache project is that it should finally make it easy for data scientists to apply separate tools to different parts of big data problems. Well, hurrah to Tim Cook and Apple. But where's the other big boys in the industry? Ahem. Hey, Google. You would have to be living under a rock to have not heard about Apple's fight with the FBI. The gist is that the Bureau boys have picked the most inflammatory case possible to whip up public opinion against Apple so that will, they will purposely weaken the security on their mobile devices. But Tim Cook has drawn a line in the sand and told the FBI that their history of helping them does not extend to them weakening future versions of iOS. I say good on Tim Cook, but I wonder why folks like Google haven't jumped onto the bandwagon for this topic. Now, we all know that you want faster wireless. And guess what? AT&T wants to sell it to you. In the second quarter of 2016, AT&T will be rolling out a field trial of their 5G fixed wireless service in Austin, Texas. 
Telecom giant has partnered with Intel and Ericsson to, ve to develop tech that is expected to boost wireless speeds between 10 and 100 times over LTE, while simultaneously dropping latency of wireless connections into the single-digit millisecond territory. How fast is that in the real world? Well, nobody really knows, which is why the deployment is merely a test of potential hardware and protocols for the emerging 5G standard. But still, AT&T will be measuring the speed of the new service in gigabits per second instead of megabits. So it's going to be significant, if not a game-changing boost. Well, that does it for the blips. When we come back, we're going to jump into the bite. There is just one story that has captured the hearts of every IT person on the planet this week. And that, of course, is the Apple DOJ confrontation. But before we get to that, let's go ahead and thank the sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And I'm going to start off by asking you a question. And that is quite simply, do you run a business? Or are you responsible for hiring the talent for the business that you're a part of? Because if you are, you understand that the people you bring on board are responsible for your success or your failure. That's where the next billion dollar idea is going to come from. That's where the next big project is going to come from. That's where your next big sale is going to come from. So you need to put some thought, some resources, and definitely the time into getting the right people into the right job. Well, that's exactly what ZipRecruiter understands. Thanks to ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites with a single click and be instantly matched to candidates from over 6 million resumes. Now, just listen to Dan. He's an actual ZipRecruiter client and he wrote, the hardest part about running a business when you need to hire is that you have to spend extra time recruiting while you're short-staffed. But with ZipRecruiter, I've gotten quality candidates within 24 hours of posting a job. ZipRecruiter's website makes this process so much faster by letting me manage my candidates in one place. Just post once, and within 24 hours, you can watch your candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. They've been used by over 400,000 businesses, and you can try it now for free. Getting the right people for your company is so important. Do you really want to leave it up to chance? Today, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Gentlemen, Curtis, Chebert, there is one story, and I know that this network has covered it. I know it's been covered ad nauseum, but... I want to take a little step back and, and let's talk about the tech. Let's talk about some of the issues that go into this Apple versus the DOJ slash FBI. Here's what we know. On Tuesday, the U.S. District Court of California issued an order compelling Apple to quote unquote assist the FBI in accessing the data in a locked iPhone 5C that was used by one of the San Bernardino shooters. Now, in response, Tim Cook posted an open letter on the front page of the Apple website stating that Apple would vigorously fight this order. Now, this this is a war that has been brewing for, for quite a while. Let's just start with that. Chebert, we've seen a lot of back and forth from legislation that is trying to block encryption to you've got the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the CIA saying there needs to be a backdoor encryption to them backing off from that and saying they would just like cooperation from the high-tech companies when they're doing their investigations. This, this was inevitable, right? I mean, if it wasn't Apple, it was going to be another company. At some point, we need to figure out what we do with encrypted devices. Yeah, uh, and it actually has kind of an interesting spin. Wayne Rash on eWeek actually posted a really interesting article yesterday. And um, basically, his concept was... What a lot of people don't want is they don't want the DOJ to have that back door themselves. Um, the compromise that Wayne actually proposed was, yeah, Apple might have something they can do, say, in a laboratory basis that only Apple can do and unlock it and then give it to the FBI. That sounds like an interesting compromise. But at the heart of this is that the DOJ wants Apple to weaken the security so that the FBI can brute force the password instead of having it um, wipe the phone after two, after 10 tries. That is the heart of the matter, and that is something that is unacceptable to almost everybody I know in the industry, whereas they should be going for a compromise. Yeah, and I think that's, that's what technologists are seeing down the line. The FBI wants to make this the narrative of, look, we just want the one phone. Just help us with this one phone. That's all we're asking. This has nothing to do with anything that we might need in the future. 
But anyone who's ever dealt with this kind of technology knows that doesn't exist. You cannot do that. There is no such thing as creating this technology in a vacuum, which, by the way, remember, the technology, the, the software that the FBI and, and now the DOJ is asking Apple to use does not exist. So in, a, in essence, they are compelling a company under an obscure 1700 law to create something that doesn't exist to do something they don't know is possible which is fantastic. And we'll get to the, into the technology a little bit uh, in, the, uh, in the future because it is, it is absolutely fascinating. Uh, Curtis, I want to throw this over to you because something that Chibert mentioned was people are saying, why can't you do a one-off? Uh, I, I was actually on a ra radio program yesterday and we were talking about this. And I said, the issue with that is that doesn't exist in this world because unless you plan to kill all the engineers who developed the solution for you, this information will somehow make it out in the public, especially once people know that it's possible. Uh, is there a precedent for this? Have we seen this kind of technology before? Um, that's a good question, and I don't know that we've seen this because as uh, I read the same uh, article that Wayne uh, Rash wrote, um, and, and it's true. Basically, the, the FBI has finessed this a little bit. They haven't specifically asked Apple to break the encryption. And that, that's a non-trivial piece. What they've asked them to do is break the security that contains the encryption so that they can brute force it. And I think the, the real issue here is one that, uh, that we're used to seeing at conferences like Black Hat. You know, at Black Hat, you get researchers who do proof of concept attacks on vulnerabilities. And we all know that once you show that a particular technology is vulnerable, then it's only a matter of time before other researchers, whether white hats or black hats, find that vulnerability independently or maybe others. What we have right now is a system in which there is not a known vulnerability. And I think Apple is being very careful not to prove that one exists. Because if they do so, then it encourages other hackers to look for it. Um, this is, in fact, a case that in some senses has been sort of manufactured by both sides. And the theater here is going to be fascinating and exceptionally important to watch as it plays out. Yeah, actually, thank you. Thank you. Incredibly important part there, which is there is a lot of theater, and I think we need to back away from the theater because it's too easy to get caught up in the emotion of this case. Let me say that uh, personally, my opinion is the FBI and the DOJ do have a legitimate reason for asking for a solution to a problem they've had for a while, which is once they've received a warrant. So this is, this is not unwarranted tapping. This is they have received a warrant for an investigation. They need a way to proceed in that investigation if the data is stored on an electronic device. On Apple's side, they understand it from the engineering standpoint, which is you cannot weaken encryption just a little bit. If you weaken encryption, if you add a backdoor, if you add an exploit, you have broken that encryption. Uh, and, of course, they're both stating their case, and they're both trying to vilify the other. But I, I think we, as the audience, need to understand that, yeah, there, there needs to be some sort of compromise, but you can't destroy encryption, and you also can't make it impossible for law enforcement to do their job, which is why this is so difficult. That's why it's such an emotional issue. Now, let's dive into the technology a little bit because uh, it, it is fascinating. In 2014, Apple announced that they were moving to full device encryption, full drive encryption, which means that everything on the phone that's stored, all the data, is encrypted from the moment it enters into the electronics. That means you can't take the chips out and put it into another device and try to read it that way. It won't work. It's, it's, it's like crypt locking, uh, crypt locking your hard drive. So what the DOJ actually wants and what the FBI actually wants is they want a way around the system that Apple has created for this full device encryption. It works this way. There is a master key for every phone, but Apple doesn't have it. Apple doesn't keep a database of it. Apple couldn't get it if they wanted. It's based on the hardware that that particular phone has. So it is a singular key. It only exists on that phone. If you destroy it, you will never be able to access the information on that phone. Now, you could brute force it. The FBI and the DOJ and the NSA and the CIA have computers that can push hundreds of millions of combinations at a, at a key and try to get into it that way. 
But the issue that they're running into is the fact that Apple has that 10 try limit. If you try 10 times and you enter the wrong code 10 times, it will wipe the memory and it's gone. You can't get it back. It's impossible. That's what the FBI and the DOJ want Apple to circumvent. They want them to create A, custom firmware, and B, a way to upload that custom firmware into a locked phone that would remove the limitation. Because if they don't, what would happen is the phone will kill its master key, and now not even that phone can read the data. So, Chiebert, th this, is, this is puzzling on so many levels to a lot of people because many people in the FBI are trying to make this seem as if Apple has the key and they just won't, won't use it. We, we know that's not the case, right? Correct. And I'd like to address something from the chat room, Emily the Strange. Um, she's making a, well, yeah, she's making a comment that she's sure someone in F, people in the FBI know how to do this kind of stuff. They know about crypto. And that is totally and completely correct. But the issue is, this is no longer just a simple one, one pin. It's now what is in essence, multi-factor authentication on your phone. Not only do you have to have the pin, but you also have to have the profile of the um, device itself. And it's not just a hardware profile. It is, in essence, something along the lines of what you would have on Windows, like a SID, a system ID. It is rolled during the sysgen process, and it is unique to the phone, and it is salted by the pin number. So this is really and truly really strong encryption and the only way to break in you you can't just image the phone and then do your 10 tries oh wipe okay put it back and start again because now it no longer matches once you've done the restore so that's the whole issue that's what the fbi can't break into the nsa can't break into it's good strong well-designed encryption and the fbi doesn't know how to get past that uh, Chiever, uh, we've got some comments running in the chat room, which is great, by the way. I love the fact that uh, our audience is, is discussing this, because this is something that is worthy of discussion. Um, and and th let me just throw, th throw this at you, Chiever. Some people say, hey, wait a minute. Why can't Apple just develop this in a closed lab and with no network access, and you swear all the, the engineers to secrecy, and it's just used this one time, and then you destroy it? I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the, well, why not case. What would you say to someone like that? Because we've got people like Scott Aran who's saying, look, you can't ever create this kind of technology for a one-use case. It's always going to exist. It's always going to persist. But how, how would you convince that person who is dead set on doing it just once from, from thinking that that's a viable solution? I think that's actually more a question for Denise and the Twill gang because this is all about legal precedence. Once you demonstrate that it can be done, you can be forced to do it again. It's precedence. The it's not a technology issue. It's a legal issue. And Apple and Tim Cook do not want to open that door. And I don't blame them. Actually, yeah, that's interesting. Because right now, they could still say it's technically impossible. You can't do that. But once you've done it, and they know yep. that you can do it, then they can compel you to do it. Yep. Hmm, interesting. All right, Curtis. Let's, let's back up even further, because I, I think a little bit of the background of this whole debate would be interesting and a good point for our discussion. And that is, this has been building in various ways in many of the stories that we've covered on This Week in Enterprise Tech. You may remember, we covered, what, a, a year and a half, maybe two years ago, a case in Florida of a man who was arrested because of information that was taken from his phone, even though law enforcement knew that they did not have a warrant for the phone and they could not check the phone even though they could check the location records from the cell towers, they did it, and eventually the case was thrown out. And we've had case after case of pushback where the, the idea of having so much information in a single electronic device was just too compelling for law enforcement to, to follow the law. And that's really re led to the development of encryption. I mean, if, you, if you just go back 10 years, none of our phones were encrypted. Uh, and, and the reason why we started encrypting it and the reason why we started asking for that as a feature from the manufacturers who sell the phones to us was because we saw our rights being violated. So in essence, this is an issue that started with our rights being violated that developed as we developed technology to keep our rights from being violated. And now law enforcement is coming back and saying we need to violate your rights in order to prosecute the people who are breaking the law.
Is that about right? It, it, I think it's right. And furthermore, there, there's another important component to this. We are all discussing this as an entirely United States-based issue. Forgetting that Apple and the people, the companies that have come to uh, to support them, Google, Facebook, the others, are not just U.S. companies. These are international companies. And if you recall, uh, a handful of years ago, there was a certain newsworthy event in which the world became aware of not only the scope of U.S. government surveillance, but the degree to which many of the companies in the U.S. had cooperated with that surveillance. And there was massive pushback by many people who don't live in the U.S. There are people who live in England, France, China, <laughs> name the country, who aren't at all thrilled with the idea that a U.S. company would help a U.S. government agency look at their information. So what a lot of these companies have done in, in their support of privacy, yes, I give them credit for being principled in their support, but it's also a very cold business calculation designed to enhance their reputation globally. Because once again, if this technology exists, something to get into to those, those phones, Imagine that it's not just the U.S. government that wants it, but governments all over the world now want the ability to look at the, the data on their citizens' phones or they'll close their markets to Apple or, or whatever other company is involved. That's the true nightmare scenario, and that's why I think Apple is willing to fight so hard on this particular case. I think you're right. I think that is the nightmare scenario. And unfortunately, we're already starting to see symptoms of the nightmare scenario as it gets enacted because we, we've already got countries that are demanding certain restrictions on Internet access in their particular country, in their particular jurisdiction. Uh, and, yeah, you do run into the issue of, of one country saying, well, if you're going to do it from the United States, you're going to do it for me. Or if Russia can do this, that means we can do this as well. Or if they've got the data stored in Ireland and the United States can still reach in, then shouldn't China be able to do that as well? I, I think what this boils down for me, when, when I look at this, and, and again, remember, I'm not taking one side or another. I'm not saying Apple's in the right here. I'm not saying the FBI is in the right here. I think they both have merits that need to be considered. But the bottom line for me is, do our constitutional protections for us in the United States, do our constitutional protections exist in a digital world? And that still has not been answered. Many people think that we figured that out, but we haven't. We haven't figured out the Fifth Amendment. We haven't figured out the First Amendment. And until we do, then I don't think we have a really good way to, to say what is more important to us when it comes to our digital persona. Chibert, I want to give you last words on this because I know you, 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 uh, you're you wondering about the ACLU. You're wondering about some other entities that should be joining into this fight. How do you see this shaking down over the next month or so? I see this actually becoming a global case. Um, I am absolutely sure that the U.K. and a lot of the other European Union people are going to jump in eventually. Uh, one of the people in the chat room, PC Guy 8080. 88 actually said uh, had a um, Canada Canadian article about how they're actually jumping into the fray. This is not going to end just in California. Um, this type of this type of precedence has global ramifications, and it ain't going to stop. I mean, this is going to be a wildfire that's going to really go crazy, and I would not be surprised if just about every uh, clandestine services agency on the planet gets into the fray in one way or the other. And that's also why I think every major IT manufacturing firm needs to get into the fray because this, this will change the future of IT. Oh, uh, we're going to stop here because I, I know that people have heard this story a lot. And actually, we're going to be talking about it next week. We're bringing in a guest, Jonathan Sander, the VP of Product Strategy for Lieberman Software Corp., who's going to be discussing this issue specifically. How is this going to affect IT beyond the knee-jerk reactions, beyond just the headlines, beyond just the, the, the buzz cuts? 
how will we in the IT industry have our livelihoods changed by a decision one way or the other? So stay tuned for that next week for This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, when we come back, we're going to be bringing in a guest, Ron Culler, who's going to be talking about the Internet of Insecure Things. If you are one of these people who has been falling twice and you understand that we kind of laugh at the IoT for its security foibles, you're going to want to stay tabbed. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the sponsor for this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's Igloo Software. Now, do you remember the first time you saw your company's intranet? Well, way back when. I mean, it was probably very exciting, right? I mean, it was a private internet. It was something just for you, for your company, that had all the information that you needed, all the tools, all the scheduling. It was, it was fun, like the first time you ever used the internet, period. Of course, that intranet that you saw 10 years ago or more is probably not as sexy now as it was then anyone who's worked in that corporate environment knows how painful those intranets can be the content is stale the interface is ugly and you can't access it on your mobile devices which is why we're so happy to have igloo as a supporter of the twilight right because they get all that how igloo is an internet that you'll actually like and that means an internet you'll actually use it's a cloud portal that enables you to share files, collaborate on documents, blog updates, coordinate calendars, and manage your projects, all from the same attractive and intuitive interface. Of course, a beautiful and intuitive interface isn't very useful if your users can't actually access it on the devices that they're using, which is why Igloo built in responsive design. It automatically reformats itself to your phone or your tablet. It's also customizable. You've got SharePoint, Salesforce, Active Directory, and soon Dropbox and Box, all of which can live inside the igloo, branded with your look and feel and accessible on all your devices. That's actually very important because you don't want your employees to feel as if they're jumping from one platform to the next. You want everything in one place to keep them focused and keep them on task. Now, we've been talking a lot about security. So what about security on the igloo? Well, how about SSL and 256-bit encryption baked into a variety of access, authentication, and identity services to ensure that only your authorized users have access to the data that they need. Now, they offer plans starting as low as $3 per month per user, and unlike other solutions, you get full access to Igloo's full suite of tools, all for that one low price. Volume pricing is also available, and it's used by government agencies and companies like Hulu, Inventive Health, American Family Insurance, and IP Switch. If they trust the Igloo, shouldn't you too? Sign up now and try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit. That's igloosoftware.com slash twit. And when you sign up through our link, you can get your own igloo for up to 10 people absolutely free for as long as you want. Folks, that's free for as long as you want. Why wouldn't you try it now? That's igloosoftware.com slash twit. igloosoftware.com slash twit. And we thank Igloo for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Now it's time for my favorite part of the show when we introduce our guest and uh, we get rocking. We've got Mr. Ron Culler from uh, Secure Design. He is the CTO and he's going to be talking to us about the Internet of Insecure Things. Ron, thank you very much for coming on to the show. Appreciate the opportunity. Now, uh, for the folks playing along at home, can you, can you explain what, what is Secure Designs? Uh, we're a managed Internet security firm. Uh, focused on the micro SMB, so you know the the vast majority of businesses in the U.S. are are under 100 employees, and that's a market we, that we focus on, and and we're one of the largest providers of internet security offerings in that space. Uh, before we get into the IoT, uh, I, actually, I'm very curious about that. What do you find to be different about the micro SMB space versus, say, the large enterprise space? What what are the challenges as they as they differ? Uh, one of the biggest challenges is that most IT or most organizations, when they have, say, 50 employees or less, they may have an IT person on staff. A lot of times, though, they've outsourced that. They've got a, uh, an IT services company providing something, desktop supports, help desk, things like that. And they just simply don't have the staff. They don't have the, the expertise in-house. And security is something that, that was near and dear to our hearts, so we focus on that. That's all we do. We're, if you can't print... I feel your pain. If you can't print across a VPN tunnel, then that's an issue for us. But um, it's it's something that the small businesses are actual, and they're targets right now. They're probably the single biggest targets in the in the um, uh, the hacking community right now because they're so simple to get into. So we're out there trying to help uh, protect those guys, just like the big guys. Right, right. Uh, we used to say that this was the low hanging fruit, but 
that that analogy doesn't hold anymore because the low hanging fruit in this case the internet it's so much bigger than the enterprise class networks it's not just low hanging fruit this is basically the entire tree uh, uh, ron iot the internet of things has been a buzzword for at least two years uh, it's right. it's the next big profit center every major business is trying to get a piece of the pie uh, and you've got startups all around the world who are releasing IoT branded devices. Uh, the, and the promise, of course, is easy access to a lot of data that you can then run through a big data engine and get yourself some fantastic correlations that will make you the next billion dollar business. Right. But we've also seen this, this very, well, I, I'm going to say concerning trend about IoT being ridiculous, ridiculously insecure. In fact, at the last two CES, Consumer Electronics Shows, I'm sorry, we actually, we don't call it that anymore. It's just CES. We had major speakers come in and talk about how the next generation of IoT needs to be more serious about security. What's your take? What have you seen? As more and more devices come out and more and more devices are being called Internet of Things, have you seen security increase? Uh, no, no, it doesn't increase at all. Um, what you end up with is IoT is is much like cloud was a few years ago. It's a it's a fancy marketing word for networking and and computing that we've been doing for 20 plus years now. The problem is the the people that have moved into the IoT world used to live in small islands, completely isolated from networking, isolated from most computing, and they were able to enable. Uh, with an Ethernet address, Ethernet interface or, or wireless interface, enable a device. You saw it in, in uh, VoIP. So every VoIP phone that you have sitting on a, on a desk, that's an IoT device. You've got um, cash registers that were just dumb calculators, you know, a, a souped up adding machine that is now a PC. You've got the terminals sitting beside of them. You have all of these devices now that have become enabled. So you have non-technology companies selling technology and they have no understanding of it. They don't make it, they don't support it. All they do is get their name silk screened across the front of it. And at the end of the day, it's the consumer or enterprise that is left holding the bag. Do you think, is that the, the biggest security issue with uh, the, the current crop of IoT devices? It's, it's, it's not the large professional enterprise manufacturers that that are having issues with this it's it's the little guy who just thinks well wouldn't it be cool if my toaster was suddenly on the internet it, 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 is that is I'm, am i hearing you right no no what's happening is that the guys in the enterprise they've jumped on the bandwagon because oh, this okay. is the next cool thing got it so they they rushed out to grab any iot device and silk screen their name on it and plug it in you know to think that um that somebody like train manufactures their thermostat and the software on it or simply say manufactures everything on their device um, it just doesn't happen you know they're they're going out contracting third parties to actually integrate these things into their system whether it's a refrigerator your dishwasher your thermostat uh, the alarm systems the the door controls whatever it may be in your home or your business these things are coming in and the organizations that are bringing them in don't understand them Oh, I'm glad that you're you're starting to get down to uh, the brass tax level. Let's let's go ahead and, and make this concrete. I I know my audience pretty well, and I know nothing moves them to action more quickly than ridicule. Uh, so, <laughs> do you? What are the concrete cases that you've dealt with, or that you've looked at, that you you've examined of just horribly horribly designed equipment that was branded IoT that was not ready to be IoT? Well, one of the uh, one of the ones we saw recently that made a made a huge uh, impact and scared a lot of people, and there's actually legislation uh, to try to prevent this now, was uh, recently when, when the Jeep was hacked, um, you took a vehicle control system, which is a computing system designed sp specifically for the vehicle controls and engine management and things like that, and you put an infotainment system on top of it. Those two systems should never have been connected. You should never have been able to upload a firmware through the infotainment system and then gain access to that. That's just bad design. Uh, and it's, it's proof of organizations that have never built computing environments, writing an application and saying, oh, well, this is really neat. Let's just shove this together. Um, it's going to get ugly um, over the next few years because 
uh, back in November, there was a, there was a, an article out of a research group that went out and they looked at over 4,000 embedded devices from 70 plus vendors. These are modems, routers, gateways, IP phones, you name it, cameras. And what they found was that the private keys, the encryption keys, the authentication uh, hashes, those things are the same on a lot of those devices. So what that means is you've got somebody building something. Somebody says, oh, that's pretty neat. You know, I'm just going to take that and rebrand it, put my skin on it, and sell it as my product. And it's not going to get better. Right, right. I'm actually glad that you brought up the Jeep example because my technical director, Brian Burnett, and I were, were at DEF CON uh, and Black Hat when they presented that. It was absolutely the most attended presentation ever. And uh, one, of the, one of the shocking things when they were going through how they did the hack, is they said the only security, literally the only security measure that they took, and I know even know if you could call it a security measure, is they obfuscated the port. They used a port that's normally used for right. chat. And they figured that would keep out any, any bad actors, which was, and it's ridiculous. And it, uh, something that you said, uh, which is those systems never should have been connected, Unfortunately, I think that's what most of the public thinks. Most of us would look at a, a, an infotainment system and we'd say, there's no way that's linked to the, the controller area network that controls the engine and the brakes and the steering. Right. That would just be ridiculous. And in the same way, most of us will look at an airplane and say, well, there's no way that in any way, shape, or form, the entertainment system that serves me my movies would be connected to the avionics. But I think what we're starting to realize is that with the IoT and with this mad rush to make everything IoT there's some really bad design choices being made. Exactly. That's, a, that's the biggest piece of it is that these things are really poorly designed to begin with. And we see it in enterprises where it doesn't come through the traditional IT channel where uh, you know, it goes into the CIO or into the IT services group. They're not the people finding these things on networks uh, or not bringing them in at least. These things are coming in through other means like um, facilities management and and security and things like that. They, you know, these things show up on their network. Imagine if you have a team of 30 to 50 people in an IT shop in an enterprise and they're able to find this thing and take it off. They've got policies, they're able to do it, deal with it. But then you have everybody else. There's five and a half million businesses with under 100 employees. They have no idea. So when they get their uh, retail shop, gets their cash register from their local point of sales company, they don't understand networking and security, so how can they apply the things that they need? Uh, we're, you know, it's cheap, it's easy. We can hang a, a, a couple of IP video cameras in the space, maybe some phones or an access control. And next thing you know, all of these things that are should never be plugged into the same environment together, all, all of a sudden are, and every one of them are a risk. Right, right. And yeah, and, and unfortunately, um, a lot of those devices will never get patched. Uh, now, here, here's here's something I, I want to I want to get your take on this. Um, my personal philosophy about these devices is everything's going to get hacked. I don't care how much time and effort you've put into right. something. Eventually, someone will figure out a way to bypass the security. So you better have some sort of method, some sort of process to be able to push out a security patch to your device when eventually someone does exploit it. Uh, and for me, that's that has that's been what's differentiated good IoT manufacturers from bad IoT manufacturers. If your IoT device cannot be patched, if, if the patch is to throw it away, that tells me that you, you don't understand security. I mean, have, have you seen a lot of that as you've been uh, analyzing the devices? I have. Um, one of the things we've, we've seen is that most of the people that are, that are designing these things, they're putting them out, you know, they don't understand that technology is, uh, very well at all. So if they don't have things like um, a 3G, 4G uh, cell backup capability or over-the-air wireless uh, abilities to, to, to push firmware out and boot to secondary firmware uh, uh, installs or, or software updates, it's going to get really, really ugly because the people that purchase these, they don't know to go ask. They're never going to go out and ask, should I you know, go out and patch all my IP cameras in my office? Well, who made them? That's an issue that, that we see a lot now. Um, to give you an example, I saw recently an infotainment system in a recent model um, car. I think it was about a 2000, 
15 car to update the infotainment system the, uh, with the GPS and the, the actual software. It took 16 CDs. <laughs> so there was a technician sitting there loading a CD in and waiting and then taking it out, loading the next CD in. These are over-the-air systems. They're all connected. Why can't you just do an over-the-air update? Um, that's the kind of technology issues that we see nowadays is that you have all these companies that are rushing in to bring the latest whistle, the feature uh, to the customer. They don't want to miss out on the opportunity, but they don't design computing systems. They don't design uh, networks. So they don't understand the differences and the, the nuances that really need to be put in place. Right. Uh, you know, it, actually, we've we've got a chat room running right now. We've got Almost Networking and CEO of CR1, who are longtime members of the Twyte Riot. And uh, they, they bring up an interesting point, which is, but wait a minute. Another connectivity option, doesn't that just increase the vectors of attack? Doesn't that just increase the attack surface? And I, I think, yeah, that, that is a good point. By, by adding another connectivity option, you do give attackers another way to try to get into the device. But then I go back to my original point, which is it's going to get hacked. Every device is going to get hacked. I don't care who makes it. I don't care how well they've designed their security. There's going to be someone who figures out an exploit. And so for me, that is that is a, a trade-off. Increase the attack surface, but also increase the ways for you to fix an exploit once, it ha once it's happened. But, and, and Ron, this is where I want to bring you in, that additional way to fix the device doesn't work unless the company is dedicated to actually fixing the device. It sounds to me what what you've been describing is that a lot of these manufacturers create a device, sell it, and then basically leave it in the wild and they'll never touch it again. Yeah, a lot of them have no idea how to to actually go through an update. So imagine trying to to call Samsung and say, "I need an update for my refrigerator. It's malfunctioning." <laughs> Who do you call? Uh, Samsung's a gargantuan company, so it's the same with things like Ford and and uh, and some of the other the the other manufacturers out there. You really have to dig deep. And, you know, if you want to play in a space with computing, then you really need to play in the space with computing. That right. means you have right. to put the people together, put the teams together, and control the software. Write it yourself. Understand it. You know, be willing to push the updates out when they need to be pushed out. Ron, right, I, I want to bring in my co-hosts in uh, just a bit for our, our finishing panel discussion. But uh, I, I'd, like, I'd like a nugget of wisdom for you. If... If you are running a business that maybe is struggling with creating policy for Internet of Things devices, or if you are considering the, the deployment of Internet of Things devices for your business model, what are some of the things that you think should be in the planning stages before any devices are bought, before anything is deployed? What are the considerations that need to be in the back of your mind? Uh, you really have to go out and talk to the people who run your network. Um, if you're a business, talk to the people who design and manage manage your network for you to in, understand exactly what it is you're, you're about to deploy on your, uh, on your environment. If you're a manufacturer and you're wanting to deploy something, go out and ask the IT industry, what are the best practices? We're about to become an IT company. So how do I do this? Hire the people, uh, contract, partner, whatever you can do, but you need to get the expertise. That's actually a great idea. And actually, I love that phrase, we're about to become an IT uh, company. And some companies exactly. who never thought they would be touching IT because it is so per pervasive now, yeah, you need to understand IT. You need to have a security policy. You need to talk to people who are actually in the know before you open up a vulnerability in your network. Exactly. That's, that's oh, okay. When we come back, we're going to be bringing Brian and Curtis back into the mix. We're going to have a conversation with Ron about some of the issues that we have uh, encountered in our travels on the vast plains of the internet. But before we do that, I want to talk about an Internet of Things device that I actually like, and it's the Ring Video Doorbell. Now, this, this is what the Ring Video Doorbell looks like. This is the kit that you get when you purchase one of these. Inside this, this wonderful little box is everything you need to get installed up and running in just a couple of minutes. My dad, who right now, he's, you know, he's getting a little older, but he was able to install this in about 20 minutes, you've got everything from the drill bit to the charging cable to the level to the mounting screws and a security screw so people don't walk off with your Ring Video doorbell. Now, it is a doorbell. So if you push that button, it's going to make that wonderful tone inside your house and tell people that there's someone waiting at the door. That's what a doorbell does. 
But beyond that, it allows you to start a two-way conversation. If someone rings the bell, you can answer it on your mobile device. And you can see them, you can hear them, and they can hear you. Now, it's, it's not just a way to announce that someone has come to your home. It's also a security device. There is a motion detector here so that you can set a threshold for being advised when someone comes within, say, the, the front yard or to the front door. Uh, this is the actual video from the Ring Veto doorbell that I have set up at my parents' home. This is a way for me to keep tabs on who might be coming to the house. Uh, I, I installed this because in that neighborhood they were having issues with people coming up to the door, and it's filled with a lot of retired people, ringing the bell once or twice, maybe coming back a couple of days in a row just to see if no one's there. Maybe they're away on a vacation, or maybe they know that they're always gone at noon because they go up to the club, and then that's when they break in. Well, with the Ring Video Doorbell, we actually have video of them doing that, and we can find out if someone keeps coming back over and over again. We can see if they start scanning through the window. I, I tell you, it's been a peace of mind. Now, installation is very, very easy. This actually has a battery, so if you have no access to power, you can charge it with a micro USB cable, and, uh, well, you'll be up and running in moments. One charge is good for a year. If you do have power, so if you have a current doorbell, this hooks up into house power and converts it into the voltage that you need to keep your Ring Video door doorbell charged forever. Uh, folks, uh, you know, we have been talking about the Internet of Things and security, so, of course, I'm, I'm going to want to address this. People know that uh, there was an exploit that was found against the Ring Video Doorbell that allowed people who might take this off your door to find the password for your Wi-Fi network. Well, this is what I'm talking about. A company like Ring actually responded immediately, and they came out with a patch that would push out over the air, over your connected Wi-Fi device, and, and update the firmware on the Ring Video Doorbell so that was no longer a potential attack. Folks, it's not just peace of mind. It's trust in a company that does it right. I love the Ring Video Doorbell, and I think you will too. Why not try the device that was called one of the best, the top 10 gadgets by both Time Magazine and USA Today? Go to ring.com slash enterprise. That's ring.com slash enterprise for free expedited shipping. And to try the device that I trust my parents to, that's ring.com slash enterprise. Once again, ring.com slash enterprise. With Ring, you're always home. And we thank the Ring Video Doorbell for its support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Let's go ahead and bring the uh, the good old boys back in here. Chibert and Curtis, you have been quietly listening, chomping at the bit. Uh, Chibert, <laughs> I'm going to start with you because I, I almost feel I feel a disturbance in the force. I'm thinking that you've got a rant coming. Well, actually, I just have an observation. I'm in, I'm in an industry where we use a lot of Modbus, mm -hmm. and I am getting a really, really bad case of deja vu when I hear about all the things that are going on with IoT. There's... Too many manufacturers, too many people that have things that worked fine on an isol in an isolated world. And so security might not even be there. You know, Modbus actually has zero security. Right. Well, the big problem is now they're putting these things on the Internet. That's a big problem. And so I'm getting a really bad case of deja vu, and I'm sure Ron is too. Oh, yeah, it's it's going to be huge. The um we're already seeing it with some of the um, the energy management and uh, HVAC uh, vendors that are out there. They're starting to put in systems to remotely monitor and manage um, uh, chillers and things like that, and power units inside of uh, inside of an organization. Traditionally, right now, it's in the data center space, but it's the same type of thing. It's took it from a Modbus, took it from a completely standalone, isolated environment. And now we're going to plug that thing into the internet. So imagine you you do this now with um, all the controls on your uh, on your water plants, on your sewer plants, uh, your gas plants, any kind of pipeline out there. The the controls are going out all over the place, and everybody wants to be able to remotely monitor and manage these controls. But the people who are installing them, a lot of times, are electricians and have no idea. So they just you know. It's the, the, the standard password, um, go on to the next one. The standard password, go on to the next one. Because the next guy that has to come in and fix it, he's not going to have to go back to a, a central facility and get, it, and get a key. He's going to put in the standard password and do what he has to do. I, I don't know what you two are on about. I, I love Modbus. It's uh, one of the easiest systems to break into. Uh, so, you know, that's made my job a lot easier. But uh, seriously, uh, we're, we're talking about Modbus because that, that directly 
relates to our work. But um, I think this goes for pretty much any technology that existed before we started putting everything on the internet. I, mean, I can think of the control area network inside cars. It, that works exactly. really well right. until you add an external connection to it because it was never designed to have that. Uh, and uh, like what they did with the Jeep, the Jeep hack was they pivoted. They had a device that connected to the control area network but was not supposed to give access to the control area network to a device on the internet. But once they owned that device, they said, yeah, go ahead and turn that on. Uh, right. Or we go, let's go even more simple. TCP IP was never envisioned to be a secure protocol. It was, it just worked. It worked, right. and so we used it. So how do you fight that, Ron? I mean, th this is not just a device. This is generations and generations of thinking. As you said, if it works, that electrician who hooks everything up, then it must be good. Right. Um, it's it's really going to be hard. I mean, the, the explosion of IP-enabled devices um, has really just... It, it's gotten to the point, and we all know with IPv4, where we've technically run out of addresses, and everybody's scrambling to to uh, to implement IPv6. When that happens, you've got end-to-end -end encryption, and if you have no idea what's going on, like you said, these are computing devices. If I own the device, I own whatever it's connected to, and you know, it's just these things were not designed to do what they're doing today, um, and unfortunately, nobody's going to put that try to stuff that genie back in the bottle. I don't think it's possible. Right, right. Curtis, let, let me get you in here because a lot of IT people have spent the last few years convincing their CTOs and CFOs that they need to spend money on the Internet of Things. They need to get into this cash cow. And now the same people are in the position of having to convince their CTOs and CFOs that maybe it was done prematurely, maybe they didn't do it right, and maybe they've opened up huge security holes in people's networks. Uh, is, is this something that you're talking about in Information Week? Well, it is, and it's been fascinating because we, we've covered a lot of territory in the conversation so far, but, but there are some, some big things that come around, and, and one of them is that a characteristic of our thinking in IT for the past 20 years has been a growing sense of what we like to call disintermediation. And that's really where the people at the customer take on more and more and more responsibility for integrating systems, maintaining systems, building systems, all of that. And I think it's quite possible that with the Internet of Things, we might see an opening for these intermediates, for the systems integrators, who do understand the technology, do understand the ideas around security and building secure systems to come back in and offer the service, just like IBM and Amdahl and all the others used to offer computing as a service 40 years ago. Now IoT as a service where the responsibility and more important, the liability shifts to someone else. I think that's a great opportunity. You know, the, the, the other thing is that when we're doing this, um, you know, our guest brought up something very important, that all of a sudden with IoT, you have people like electricians getting into installing intelligent systems. And uh, I was thinking about an a organization that I, I wrote about and wrote with some years ago called Bixi. Uh, Bixi is the organization that certifies and trains all of the cable pullers. If you need a right. master cable plant architect, you look for Bixi certification. And they're great at what they do, but they're not great at designing the devices that use those cables. And so I think that looking at the certifications is going to become more and more important just because someone has an impressive string of initials behind their name doesn't mean it's the right impressive string of initials. So there are a lot of sort of back to the future ideas going on here. But for the immediate future, dear heavens, for a lot of companies, it is a mighty, mighty mess. Ron, let's, I, I want to address this feeling of hopelessness that I'm having right now, because it, as we discuss this, it seems to be that there's there's three problems. One, the hardware. 
So if the hardware isn't manufactured to be secure, it's not going to be secure. But beyond the hardware, there's also the transport layer. There's the protocols underneath it. If those weren't built to be secure, it's not going to be secure. And even if the hardware and the transport layer are secure, if the person who installs it doesn't understand what needs to be done in order to make sure that it's secure, it's not going to be secure. And if right. you take those three together, nothing is ever going to be secure. True, true. So is, is that uh, where we are? It is, but that's that's where um, I think that the, the real opportunity is, um, especially in the IT community, um, in the IT services community especially, is the idea of partnering. These guys understand network segmentation, isolation. And if you have IoT devices, if you've got um, an IP phone system, or you have IP video, or you have access controls or uh, sensors, these things can, can live in, the same, in your environment, but they need to be isolated. They need to be right. put back in that cage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, and yeah, absolutely. And in fact, our security guru here on the network, uh, Steve Gibson, he talked about that very thing about just saying, look, we need to separate all those devices that you don't explicitly trust need to be separated from the devices that you exactly. need to protect. And exactly. uh, that that's so that's that last part. You have to install them properly. Internet of Things devices can get owned. And if they get owned, you want to make sure that they're not going to affect anything else in your network. Cheaper. Exactly. Uh, let me bring you in here because you've, you've got an interesting perspective. You are an engineer. Uh, you have worked with the people who have made the standards that transport our data. And you also do a lot of the installation and training that needs to be done for the future generation of IT workers. Do you see that 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 triple threat being reduced at any time in the near future? Because it seems to me if, if any one of those isn't working properly, you get bad thermostats that make your house freeze because someone hacked in and made a display of Facebook pictures. Yeah, I actually scatter Ron and I have been bouncing stuff back and forth and he made a comment that, do you really want an IT guy playing with high voltage switch gear? And my response was, hell no. You do <laughs> it. Have... You do it all the time, no, no, no. I I absolutely do not. That <laughs> high voltage switch gear scares the bejesus out of me. That's why I always have a licensed electrician with me. Now, one thing that has changed, I, I was flabbergasted that it actually happened at, at my university is that my electrical planning group, the facilities management, actually started asking my opinion. So I'm actually, wow. I actually worked with them and worked with our campus IT. We actually now have a completely isolated and protected um, network across the entire campus just for building management. Because uh, they finally realized that how pathetically secured most of these building management systems are. So I'm actually rolling out smart meters now on a dedicated, isolated network that you can only get into through a VPN connection. Perfect. Um, we, I've, I've got a, a message in our private messaging room. I'm not, I, I don't know if this is from Ron. Ron, did, did, did you have a story about the Ford autonomous car? No. Okay, that, sorry, that was just a random message that got dropped into our no, chat No, I think room. that was originally Curtis. Oh, it was Cur Curtis. Yeah, uh, was talking. We were talking about the idea of of connectivity in automobiles, and I had a chance uh, at CES to sit down with one of the software engineers who is leading the um, autonomous vehicle development effort for Ford. Uh, we were talking about the G Pack, and believe me, the autonomous car folks are very, very aware of all of all of what went on there. And they now, on the autonomous vehicles, are doing a superb job of segmenting their networks uh, to the point that the decision-making autonomous network is air-gapped from the outside world uh, and has very tightly controlled gateways between, say, the sensor network and the actuator network and the decision network. Um, the, the automobile manufacturers are very comfortable, at least the big three, with the idea that if there is a software update needed, people should take the vehicle back to the dealer to have it done. They don't like the idea of what Tesla does with over the air because of security concerns. Um, you know, they like the idea of the control of going back to the dealer, not only 
from their security standpoint, but from the perception of the customer that this is a way that prevents hacking by removing that attack vector. So, you know, the especially in the autonomous car division, because they're very conscious about the fact that this early, they are in an absolute zero tolerance for serious error environment. They're looking at security really, really hard, and they're taking steps based on what they've seen already. Well, folks, I'm sorry, but you've done it again. You've used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of 10 hacked Internet of Things devices. I, I want to thank my panelists. I, I'm sorry we, we ran out of time. I, I, we could have talked about this for the entire episode. Uh, uh, let, Ron, let's start with you. I love the fact that you're trying to bring this out, that you're trying to make people think about security as they deploy IoT devices in their network. Could you please tell us where they can find you, where they can find your work, and uh, give, give a plug for people who are pushing for this kind of security? Sure. Um, you can find us. Um, our uh, website is www.securedesigns.com. Um, we are, uh, like I said, the, the premier managed internet security provider for the, the micro SMB um, industry. Um, anybody in this, in this technology industry right now that's actually paying attention to this, they need to get their voice out. They need to be heard. They need to be heard from a, from a legislation perspective. They need to be heard from an education perspective, from an industry perspective. Everybody has to go out there. So um, anybody and everybody that wants to listen and learn, uh, there's plenty of us out there that are willing to talk, to talk about it. Indeed. And Ron, uh, I hope you don't mind if we call you back for a future episode. I'd, I'd love to get some IoT folk onto the same episode and and do a big panel. Would you be amenable to that? Oh yeah, I've got. A, I actually have a, a panel coming up in in a couple of couple of weeks here uh, in North Carolina that I'm going to be sitting on. So it's going to be an interesting uh, conversation. I tell them it's broke. They tell me it's not. <laughs> oh really? See that actually, if you could put me in touch with with your favorite not broke panelists, because that's what I want. I, all the people who come on to this week in enterprise tech, they seem to know that IoT is broken. I would love to hear a voice from someone who says it's not. I think those are mostly marketing people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we won't say anything ill about the dead. Uh, let, let's go on to my, my co-host. It's always a pleasure to do, to do this show because it means I get to chat with Chibert and Curtis. Curtis, can you tell us what's going on with you at Information Week? I, I know we're preparing, both of us are preparing in a week or in two weeks to be in Orlando, but what do you have before that? Well, one of the big things going on at Information Week and Information Week Radio is preparation for our Information Week Elite 100 conference coming up. We've now released the names of the finalists, and over the next few weeks, we're going to be doing profiles of the finalists for the Elite 100. These are the 100 organizations with some of the most creative IT organizations and projects for the past year. Uh, some great profiles, some great ideas from IT executives on how they shepherd projects through and what they've done. Lots of great stuff. I'm looking forward to the interviews and hope lots of people will come read them and listen to them at Information Week. And that is absolutely worth a listen. Make sure to jump over and uh, see what Curtis does when he's not playing with the Twilight Riot. And of course, Chibert. I have no idea what you're doing, but it's probably going to be fascinating. What can people expect to find from you in the coming week? Well, I'm trying to finish up a um, enterprise tablet application story for InfoWorld. And I'm actually also starting to work on expanding the embedded systems curriculum to be more application-oriented computing to include a section um, pieces on big data, embedded systems, data visualization, and so forth, and actually turn it into a um, degree program. In a tribute, I will say this. I think you got more chapters of your book written while you were visiting me here in San Francisco than ever in Hawaii, so you just need to visit me more. Um, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you one and all for being part of this episode. You've made it, uh, well, one for the books. I, I personally have had a lot of fun, a lot of good information. Now, I also want to thank you the person who watches or listens each and every single week. We wouldn't have a show if you didn't stop by every week for your dose of enterprise goodness. 
and we want to give you an easier way to get the episodes that you want. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash quiet. If you go there, you'll find not just all of our back episodes, but also a mechanism that you can subscribe to have the podcast delivered to your device of choice automatically each and every single week. If you want the audio version so that you can have it on, say, your iPhone on the drive into work, you can do that. If you want the video version on your tablet so that you can watch us during your breaks, you can do that. If you want the high-definition video version so you can watch us on your laptop, your PC, your Mac, your Windows box, your Linux box, your Roku, you can do that. Just go to twit.tv slash twiet. Also, big thanks to everyone who makes this show possible. Of course, to Lisa and Leo for letting us do This Week in Enterprise Tech, to Karsten, my super producer, and to the man who, he, you know, he really holds the room together. We wouldn't have a show if it weren't for him, Mr. Cranky Hippo Brian Burnett. Brian, could you tell the folks what it is that you do at Twit? Because I really don't know. <laughs> well, it's not like we work together very often or anything. Uh, well, we do a, no a how-to show on Thursdays called Know How. We just finished up that uh, LED goggle uh, steampunk design that seems to be pretty popular right now. Uh, I mean, you do a lot of work on that, so bravo, sir. And uh, so check out that on Thursday if you if you want to know how to put stuff together. Yeah, that's right. Oh, and also, uh, we pre-recorded a few episodes because I have to go to Barcelona for Mobile World Congress. But uh, we did some freaking science, Brian. We did do some freaky science. Actually, I'm looking over at the table over there. It's, I it still see covered. our freaking science over there. Uh, so if you want to know what, what that black box was, it, it very, very, very may well have been a vortex machine so that we did, built on the show. Hey, Brian, what's in the box? What's in the box? <laughs> Folks, thanks one. Thanks all for joining us. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballister, the digital Jesuit, just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise... Let's keep quiet.